Should we get I think started? We can get this started. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, welcome to this um, experts panel about software localization, quality assurance, and functional testing. This panel is brought to you by Wordbee, and it's hosted by my colleague Robert Rogge and myself, Tanya Falkman. And in the next hour, we'll dive deep into the processes of localization, quality assurance, and software testing, focusing on workflows, methodologies, and constraints. And for our listeners, if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat box on the right hand side of your screen and we'll try to um, come to them or like answer them towards the end of the panel. Cool. So um, we're super excited to welcome our um, three panelists today, possibly four panelists. Um, and uh, we'd like to take a moment to, uh, to let you introduce yourselves. Um, so why don't we start with you, Jose? Okay, so I'm Jose Palomares. I'm a senior localization program manager at uh, Coupa Software. And I have been in the localization industry for over like 20 years in different capacities. I started as a translator and ended up doing more technical things, more technical things. Became uh, an engineering kind of guy in localization for a while. And recently moved to this other capacity at uh, on the more strategic and, and bigger picture kind of things on the buyer side this time. That's a long time on the vendor side. Awesome. Cool. So, so uh, yeah, go for it. I, I, I didn't know if you, you were going to sequence us or I should just jump in. So my name is Tex Texan. I'm a software globalization uh, architect and consultant. I've also been working in the industry for um, three decades or so. Um, I've contributed to a number of uh, the internationalization standards, and I've worked with a number of uh, companies in uh, many different spaces, uh, large uh, e-commerce companies and um, uh, web publication companies, as well as uh, medical and, and other industries. So I'm um, glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Cool. Thanks. We're, we're really happy to have you on. Um, OK, yeah, you can go, uh, Danny. OK, Hi, I'm Danny Goldschmidt. Even I wrote my short bio, so you'll see. No. Uh, so I'm a software engineer in my background. And about 20 years ago, a bit less, I joined this domain of internationalization and localization. And I saw 20 years where I'm getting old. Uh, I worked at Google as a software engineer and also in Microsoft, and I was also a consultant for many years about consulting many for localization, internationalization, both the client and the vendor side, and doing also some software development in this area. Um, I have a joke about consultants, sorry about uh, tax, you know, consultants, were, they're, doing, they're doing nothing, but they tell everyone what to do. Uh, I'm right now on a disability, so it's even perfect. I'm doing nothing, and I don't need to tell everyone what to do. So, uh, so this is the reason that you see me less today. It's consulting, but more uh, speaking. And that's it. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, so between the three of you, we've got I, what, what was it? Seventy years of combined experience. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty that's cool. funny. Funny. <laughs> Um, so we have uh, Maria Federova might be joining us from from Salesforce, um, but we're not really sure. She's she's kind of uh, might might be in, might be out. So uh, okay, cool. So okay. let's jump straight in here. Yeah, let's kick it off. Um, so actually, we wanted to kick this off with kind of like the elephant in the room, since we're talking about quality um, assurance. How do you guys define quality? Well, should I start? I'll start. So it's not my definition. First, I think it's very difficult to define quality. And the definition I'll give is a definition that uh, one time in a workshop that I moderate with uh, and tell John Road that it worked with uh, Netflix. And said, quality is actually good enough. I said, what is good enough? Yes, we need to define good enough depending on the product or the service or whatever we, we're releasing. So if it's a pacemaker, we know what is good enough the thing that we need to do. If it's a user manual of a printer, maybe the good enough is a bit less that we can have really things, you know, which are not, you know, let's perfect. So I think that by any 
product or service, and even within the product or service, with a different feature, we need to decide what is good enough. This is true, by the way, not only for localization, for you know, for all the features of, uh, of the product. You know, we have bugs or things, and not every time is that the quality is perfect or the good enough. So we need to decide what is good enough. And I think this definition really helps me when thinking that we need to do some work on quality, but in the software localization or just in, in the software. Decide what is good enough for everything before releasing it to the user or to the market. Yeah, I would agree with that, Daniel. In, in a way, it's a form of risk management um, because um, you can always spend more on quality assurance um, and the, it's a 90-20 rule or a 90-10 rule um, and somewhere along the way you, you have to say, well, um, this is uh, how much I'm willing to spend um, and then yeah. you take a look at, well, what is the impact if I have a problem or what kind of problems can I anticipate? Does the product work as expected? Um, and does it uh, work in a way that uh, enhances my brand reputation? Um, or is it something that even if it works, it might uh, work in, in some way uh, where actually it causes a problem for my customers or it gives offense uh, to customers in some way and then it comes back and, and hurts me. So or hurts my my brand and company. So um, you can always do more. So somewhere along the line, you're assessing, uh, as Daniel says, says, is it is it good enough? Um, and you know, around that, we need to have some some idea of what it is where our criteria are and what we're attempting to measure. Uh, one is you know functionality. Does it work as expected? Um, one is um, what kind of errors can we anticipate or environmental uses where uh, it might behave in unexpected ways or data conditions that might cause it um, to fail in some way. So um, the quality assurance part is trying to identify the risks um, and how uh, we can you know, ascertain whether, whether or not we've adequately covered those. Yeah, I agree. Go for it. No, for you. I have a comment, but uh, please uh, speak first. Okay. So, so for me, I'm 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 surprised and I'm glad that we don't answer this from the typical like linguistic point of view of like, uh, you know, about how accurate it is, how it resembles the source, and all of that. And I think that we are coming from a more like practical point of view, which I love. I usually just like summarize quality as like. It's really meeting expectations. So what what Tex and Daniel are like defining is like basically talking about like how you define expectations before you like tackle a given project. And then it's a, it's quality is just going to be like meet those expectations. They can be like different from like project to project, uh, organization to organization, uh, typology to typology. So uh, and, and basically meeting there's like maybe one other thing which is like meeting expectations and enabling every other like function around you to actually be able to do the same thing. So if something is, this is when we talk about like something like broken. So we go to the typical example, like the like an engine or, or some kind of like machine. If one piece, one piece is supposed to like do what it's supposed to do, meeting the expectations, but there's also like a function in relation with like everyone else around. So it's the same thing here. If language is not good enough, it's not gonna uh, enable sales to sell it, it's not going to be, enable uh, the next person in, in the value chain to do the job. So hopefully those those are easy enough to. I just love it that we're not talking about like language quality. It's just yeah. things so, that. So, so, good. Yeah, so one one of the one of the difficult parts of that is you know it's we're not uh, as individuals we might have a sense for the criteria and what's. Uh, good enough for what's right or wrong, but um, often we're leading organizations and then it, it, the challenge is um, to establish those criteria across your organization. So everybody who is uh, making measurements or, or doing some kind of assurance um, 
is looking for the same things because you might have some people who uh, maybe their bar is lower for what is acceptable so they don't report um, or ignore uh, problems that you might consider issues and then also you can be overwhelmed by people who are reporting things that uh, maybe you consider insignificant or um, and it becomes very very hard to establish uh, a reasonable criteria um, in order to have an efficient organization on what you what you're looking for i would like to add something uh i agree with i want to add to what you have on youtube comments about the expectation and also about quality in general i think that when we say good enough in the question of the business and it's not only linguistic is is it a deal breaker yes or not and what will be the experience of the user is it good enough now, clearly, in the end, it's related to the business because in the end, we're part of the business. But a good example can be that if it's an installation part of a very important app on an iPhone, which is buggy, and forget even it's not a language, it the end might be a deal breaker. But assuming that I have a $20 million agreement with a bank with enterprise software, and there's a bug somewhere, and there's this there's a IT pro that is freezing in the server room and trying to find the bug and the localization doesn't work and he cannot find it and he opens his laptop and work for five hours and then he finds the bug and fix it after Googling it. Is it good? Maybe not. Is it good enough? Yes, it's not a deal breaker. So all the time define what is, what is good enough. And basically forget software localization in life in general, life is full of bugs. And we like to do things, but many things we're doing by what is good enough for us. So, do uh, I, I think so. I just want to add, you know, in, in um, you know, it's important to have these criteria, but um, I suspect what our listeners are looking for is not, um, you know, the debate over how much is, is enough. Or, or what what quality is good enough? But how can we assure that we have quality? How do we detect yeah, really. problems? How do we find them? And, and so I, I I think maybe we should um, take the discussion a bit more in that direction rather than the uh, a little yeah. bit more ethereal. Yeah, just understanding that what we have, what we what we are. Yeah. But just but just to put it out there, what I consider you know something that we have said, but some organizations that we might have like work with, they have like what a linguist for instance will consider like garbage and it, and they're still like functioning. But there might be like, so we need to focus like you said on, on like fo on finding how bad it is as well yeah. as part of the, of the process. But in many cases, maybe that kind of like garbage is just fine. It's, uh, it's right, uh, right for us. Cool. So, so let's have that was to know that you have those issues somebody can make the decision that the problems are ignorable, um, but you need to enable people to surface the problems to have the discussion. If, um, if you establish a culture where problems don't get reported because um, people don't want to hear about them because they think they're not, you know, unless they're deal breakers, um, then you're gonna, you're gonna have a dysfunctional organization eventually. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's super interesting. So, so what should we talk about next then? How to detect, uh, you know, and how to find these problems and solve these errors, or should we talk about um, how to establish a, a company culture that uh, promotes uh, quality assurance? Fielder's choice. I, I suspect our audience is interested more in the uh, detection rather than the cultural issue to start with. All right. Cool. So let's let's do that then. So um, what then are uh, some of the the localization QA and functional testing workflows that uh, you would recommend? And like when you when you're setting out, for example, how do you decide, um, you know, how 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 you want to do things to to get the the good enough that you're looking for? So I'll start uh, first. Right now, I don't have it because I'm um, not in company. I'll, I'll, my answer will be actually with questions. So um, I think the, the first question we need to decide in the, in the, the, the product 
what is it, what needs to be tested you know we have can be the product can be a lot of other materials so what needs to be tested should be linguistic testing should be cosmetic testing should be functional testing the second question which i think is very important okay when it should be tested and this is the main issue that uh start of planning the other thing that it's okay we should test before the release i think we need to test even months before the releases of the waterfall model sometime actually we can say you know in this process we're doing let's say in Azure, it's okay to test actually after the release and then we'll you know we'll release all the bugs that we'll find and you know with the fix of all those bugs so the first two questions that i have is what should we test what we should test what should we create and then when and then a deeper question assuming in agile if i look for instance for functional testing others should be in parallel track of the development that we have a parallel track of testing all the time next to it or should be kind of the more serial that you know developing and then we do the testing and then we release developing thing so where we should put it uh, especially in agile and a question which is related to one of my questions is it okay to release something with bugs for a while or not for a while and uh, it's again about which process I'm setting. Because it's, it's, I believe we'll discuss it a bit later. Testing is very costly. And we need to understand, you know, we need to do it. But the question, you know, when and for what? So I'll, I'll, I'll see your questions and raise you some questions, Daniel. Go ahead, yeah. <laughs> because I, I, I think it's also important to establish who is responsible for yeah. testing. There are some things that can be tested right um, in in the development stage. Um, if, we're, if we're talking about software development, where functional testing uh, becomes important. If you're a translator, there are some uh, things that can be uh, where the translator can be made accountable for certain kinds of errors. They should do some spell check and grammar check. They should do a glossary check um, and there, there should be uh, tools to help them with that um, which I know you know word B has uh, quite a bit of um, tooling that, that helps translators with with those kinds of checks so the who um, is a part of your when question and the types of uh, testing that can be established I mm -hmm. think accountability um, it's important. We have uh, people that um, in our organizations who may think that, well, I do certain kinds of activities, somebody else is responsible for uh, certain kinds of checking, and it, you know, they'll, they'll report back to me if there are um, some kinds of errors. So um, establishing unit testing and uh, testing right from the get-go, testing that happens before you check in your translation or before you check in your code, um, and tools to assist with that can be important. One of the things that um, I strongly recommend, um, and this is uh, in many organizations, it's not done for quality assurance, but to train um, your QA folks. So when I work with organizations and I'm, I'm providing training on internationalization, I also set out to meet with the QA folks and say, um, well, here's what internationalization is, here's what localization is, here's what you can be looking for. Because you, many organizations treat QA as, you know what, we'll, we'll give you the functional spec, we'll give you the software, and given the functional spec, go figure out what to test, because we've told you how it should work. Um, but when it comes to internationalization and localization, if you train the QA organization as to what um, internationalization is, what localization is, you enable them to know what to look for independent of the specification for the functionality, and that um, helps them provide the right kind of testing. And it's also um, uh, exciting and invigorating for the QA organization because people often don't come to them and say, here's what this is about, here are some ways you can find uh, problems and write up bugs, and, and since that's their job, they get very excited about uh, the activity and the attention that they're getting. So I think that's an, an important step. Um, and so when you have uh, 
uh, also tools in your organization as, as WordBee offers, then providing the QA uh, folks some uh, insight into what those tools can do, how to write rules uh, for different processes. You, you're actually uh, engaging them and, and really helping them step up where they can do things that in other organizations they might not even consider, even when the tools have those capabilities. Okay, so maybe maybe I can add a little bit from after the fact. So in in reality, you try to do as much as you can, like when you're like working in internationalization, and you try to fix as many things on the source as possible. But then, what happens when you actually have like things leaking through, and you have issues? I I'm gonna say that I come from the point of view that like the more we can test, especially when it comes to like uh, software UI, the more we can like do QA, like linguistic QA. Uh, and definitely testing, but focusing on linguistic QA on on interface, the happier we're all going to be. So there's obviously going to be limitations to that. But I think that a good principle is like let's do as much as possible. And considering that a lot of like the UX, the the, uh, the design of applications, as it's going like more and more towards like simplicity, and a lot of the like, UIs are like getting much much more simplified than they used to be before. You know, when we had like the monsters. Uh, desktop applications with the more buttons and the more tabs and the more menus, the better. So the simpler things get, the more we go like mobile or, or even like mobile first. I think that it's be it's becoming like more important that we focus on, you know, there's like less strings, there's like less UI to care about. I think that we need to move towards an effort to get as much as possible, if not everything, checked. That doesn't mean that you're going to do it like all in one. And, and then the best is to like align to how the product is being built. And I'm sure there's going to be more towards like uh, agile step by step uh, and component by component uh, so kind of like cycle as opposed to like the whole thing. So if you're taking like simpler UIs, you're taking uh, shorter cycles, it should be easier to like fulfill this dream of like checking every single string that you're going to put in front of the, the user. On, on how to how to so that is where I come from. That's that's my that's my dream, right? That we do that every time. So the easiest or, or the sweetest spot that I try to chase in every capacity we can is to like provide context. So having being able to do like any work in context, whether it is like the staging and and just showing it to like the, the QAers and and or linguists, show it the life so that they can make comments on the actual product before you release it. Or even if we're talking about like screenshots, which is like less preferred, or or ideally in terms of like a more of a real time um, life preview. The more you get in that, the easier is gonna is gonna become. I'm I'm hoping that that is where we walk towards as an industry toward like having more of that. And then it's not that relevant if you do it like closer to like development or you do it like three steps later. Uh, because you probably are gonna get it done quickly with a smaller scope and on the first attempt, which I think that is also like a huge saver. A lot of like these iterations of testing usually take weeks. In some cases for some products it takes months. If we can do like in context, we should be able to like lower that definitely to to, to weeks for for uh, most sprint or most iterations. I I have few remarks to what you said. Just what what you said to us and what you said text. Um, first of all, the context. Yes. Uh, in my previous life, I was uh, I founded a company together with Hank Boxman. We name it Wiki Technology. The idea that give context, you know, for web-based uh, application. So you know the online booking system, whatever. And the idea was really simple: just give an online context, as much as you can, context to the translator and to the reviewer. Now, the reason that we did pretty good money, and Hank, by the way, I, I left it because of other reason. Hank is still uh, doing it because we show the cost of the testing in case if you don't have context, and what will be the cost of testing if you have the context of the translation, and this, you know, can shrink really, you know, the cost. You can really reduce the cost because context is so important to understand. And it's so good that in German, you know, for the word display that I cannot pronounce it, you have, I think, uh, 17 
translation, what is display, or I'm exaggerating, but you know, the context is so important. So for that, I really agree with you about this. I have a few comments about what text you said. I'm putting on the screen on you. Um, so uh, I completely agree with what you know, uh, you know, who is child of testing. And something in general, I'm in favor of testing. You know, I, when I started the question, what is, you know, well, good enough, I think testing is really important. And I think that unit testing is very, very important. And I want to think unit testing actually also for the localization. The idea of the unit testing, the developer, every time he's committing the code, checking in, he knows that what he did won't break the thing. You know, he tests it. He put testing that can then run all the time. We need to do the same thing, the verification testing in every phase of the localization translation. From generating the content, the string in English or whatever the thing, and if this fits first, you know, uh, language-wise, linguistic, but also you know, the UI and that you write the code, and then with all phases, we need to check and verificate everything. So this is something very important that you need to be testing for the thing. And if you think about it, if you, like unit testing, it's easy. It doesn't cost a lot. We're not checking, you know, 100,000 million of lines. No, it's you know, a few lines of code or, you know, one file or a few strings. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I believe we'll discuss it later, we need also do a kind of a comprehensive testing of everything when the product is ready. But, you know, we need actually every stage we need because if I'm the vendor and I, if I'm the client and I'm giving to the vendor content which is, I won't use this word, but, you know, which is awful, well, what I'll get will be awful because this is what I asked to translate. So there's many things that we can do that cost not that, that, that almost free that actually can improve the quality. This is the verification testing we need to do. So this is what you said there, the text about the, the unit test. So if I, if I can add to that one. So, uh, so the concept of unit testing probably is not like familiar, it's not uh, common in the industry as much unless you're like very close to like development. This, this, uh, but I like, I like how you compare it to like, or how you related to localization. I, I wanted to, in case someone out there is still not doing their, or thinking that this is not important. Like to me, like the unit testing for localization is making sure that you're like using like a, a, some sort of like TM system. So that any piece that you produce matches with what you have done before and beyond any checks that you make sure that it's mm -hmm. accurate, it's working, it's, it's not broken. A unit test will be like making sure that it's consistent with what you have done uh, before. And, but you know, if someone is not using such a system in their product, probably they should like go and look into it like right today because you're probably like killing yourself, wasting a lot of like someone else's money. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're doing it, I also wonder, it's like, it's, to me, it's very key that when you're in doing that and leveraging TMs and things like that, you're taking into consider into consideration again context from whatever you can get it. If you can like tag your your product and give some like metadata to identify where something is coming from, either it, a flag in a, in a file or a, a descriptive key value name, anything like that, then that's gonna make so much easier this whole process of like unit testing localization. I'm committing a new piece. And I know exactly where it fits, and it can be verified that it's working where it belongs. So if you don't have any of like the fancy live pieces, or if you're like dealing with like for instance text that never shows on screen, that's still gonna get you to to add a lot of a lot of value to the process. Yeah. So I I I agree. Um, I I think especially on the translation and localization side, there are a number of things that um, you can have which at the unit level, whether it's the word, uh, word by word translation, doing uh, syntax checks, um, glossary lookups, translation memory lookups, um, as, as well as uh, there's a number of checks that uh, WordBee builds into their system that helps translators that look for uh, punctuation being repeated, words being repeated, um, the example they give in their documentation is where you write, hello, world, world. Um, it catches those things. And, and these are um, helpful checks that um, help at the unit level. 
at, at, and at the same time, they have some capabilities for doing visualization of web pages so you can see in context. But um, we shouldn't, so it's, it's important to have those tools available and they greatly help accuracy. But at the same time, we, we shouldn't be naive. What you said is, is true, Jose, the user interfaces have gotten simpler, um, which has been a, a boon. Uh, but mm -hmm. behind the scenes, we have um, much more complexity because today um, the content that, um, that I work with often is coming from a number of different sources. It's not uh, just a, a UI um, and a little bit of catalog data. We have uh, feeds coming from different databases and different sources. And um, having checks at the unit level um, is, is a great help. Seeing the visualization is a great help. But when you have uh, this complex set of sources contributing to the page, we also need to have some uh, capability to be diagnostic about where is this string coming from? Where is this, this text content coming from? Because um, you can have situations where maybe a translator sees a problem in the context uh, to correct it, but that unit is then used in multiple places and maybe is um, wrong for the other places where it's being used. So um, we, we shouldn't oversimplify the, the situation because I, I know there are many people in the audience who are, who are um, dealing with this kind of complexity. And, and for them, designing quality assurance systems is uh, not only uh, being able to detect problems and giving uh, content creators the ability to avoid problems, but also when there are problems to have some uh, diagnostics that help them see, uh, look for problems that maybe are systematic, how the system is being integrated rather than at the unit level or simply, you know, fitting to context. So, but, but I have a, a, an answer for you, Tex, about this, uh, and I'm simplifying it again. I think that, you know, first I want to say that what we did in Wiki, it's actually on a live website while it's perfect the staging. So all the time the content is coming, this is what you see. But it's also if you're talking about, you know, application or web services with account mashable, you know, the content is coming from everywhere. So first from software development, you need to be sure that whatever application you have can deal with various content. And I'll give an example of Facebook in a moment. And and the other in the QA testing, this is what we been checked, you know, to see various type of content, you know, in different languages or whatever it is that actually we can display. I'll give an example of Facebook. Facebook is doing it today very well, but you know, I think uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, if you had, let's say, text in, in Hebrew or in Arabic, in the UI, the English UI or the French UI, it was a complete disaster because the all right left was completely, couldn't handle the thing. Now it's actually that every post or every content, they know how to deal with that and show it correctly. So I think this is something, yes, we can test actually simplify the test and test that what we're doing can deal with such languages, such cultures. But sorry, maybe there's other question you want to ask us, uh, Tanya and Robert. Uh, we just <laughs> continue to discuss here until uh, tomorrow. Yeah, that. We no, it's all good. Just a couple. <laughs> well, I think you're yeah, going to say something, Jose. We already answered half of it, so it's pretty good. <laughs> half of the question. Did you want to say something, Jose, or or did no, we go go answer. by it? Or so I I I've been like uh, going to text for uh, answers for many years now, and and I was going to ask like, can you give us like some example of like. Uh, of that kind of like combination of like different feeds or feeds or components within uh, within an application. Can you give us like any any example of that that, that uh, things that have gone wrong, been very difficult to address after the fact when people were trying to like interconnect like different units or or feeds of content. Um, let me see. I have to think about you know particular example, but you can imagine um, situations where 
um, you have feeds, you might have uh, catalog data uh, being displayed and alongside you're, you're showing ads for different products and uh, maybe one example is you don't want to be showing competitors um, when you're when you're posting some products because your uh, your suppliers may not like that. So um, you know today we have systems that are um, also you know aware of who the users are and what the users context is where they where they live uh what their shopping history is and so um as you get more personalization um that can be a good thing but it also can be um upsetting to customers when you show them the wrong uh, uh so that may give you some ideas without without getting too specific um, we're going to have conflicts and, and also um, uh, associations that you, you don't want to make between uh, two different feeds being shown simultaneously. Yeah, but Tex, I think that you're taking the discussion more than the linguistic and language of things. This is in general a software, you know, what we should do. And I think if we're going back to the language, assuming that the application is good enough in the source language, assuming you know what you tell about personalization and ads and etc. Uh, you know, uh, now the question is for language, can we also check it all for different cultures? Uh, so language, you, language is a different thing because it can be in English, but English of UK, you know, culture UK might be different, you know, different. Sure. Language. So, I, I, I had a product where. Uh, that I was working with where um, some of the content was about uh, produce like fruits um, and some of the information was about color coding right and so we would have something like the word orange um, which maybe should have been localized to color uh, but it was localized to the fruit orange which is the same word but do you other... mean uh, origin? Sorry. It's, it's, it's a little joke. <laughs> okay, sorry. Just go well, on. This is uh, the USA. Let me start in politics. Yeah, so, purple or whatever. Uh, yeah. So, um, and especially where uh, you can, where we sometimes just reference a single word so there is limited context in the location where it's being used, but you need the surrounding context. And yet, um, it, it can be confusing when the source, it, you know, you've got some something coming from resource files, some information coming from uh, catalogs, some of it is coming from uh, management systems and so forth. Oh, hey, Tanya. Hey, Tanya. Hello. It's your turn to ask a question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So like um, so so far we've mentioned uh, we've we've got a lot of stuff on the list here we've talked about unit testing accountability uh, training QA teams on localization and uh, internationalization um, testing the interface as much as possible we've got a whole bunch of stuff so like what's the biggest impediment or challenge that companies have to actually doing that stuff like why 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 aren't they doing it if, if it's so obvious. So can I be can I be very very in, in in the face with this or in the nose? So, uh, I think I think the lack of money is to mm -hmm. actually pay for it. It's uh, it's up there. So there's organizations who simply cannot afford it. You don't have enough resources, mm -hmm. uh, and then you need to like figure out another way. Uh, that I think I think that maybe next is lack of like qualified people. So people who understand this process, who can like build this process, and even people who can like test. Even, even if you're looking at the linguistic side of things, not every translator out there is going to make a good tester. So some people are amazing. You can build like a team that you can reuse across years and even organizations. When you move, you can like take them with you and, and trust them. Uh, they're like quite an asset, but it's not easy. It's not, it's not, not everyone is like cut for it. Not everyone does a good job and you might not have the time to, to, to train. And, and I think that the, uh, there's uh, so I thought about this before. I think that the other one is definitely for me again, lack of context, lack of lack of context in, in 
when it comes to like uh, language testing, it it kills you. It it just. I, I, I will add. I'm sorry, Jose. Were you, were you done? No, no, no. I I I will um, add to that. I I think uh, there's a lack of uh, appreciation for consequences um, and the need for firm project management. So I think one of the things that is difficult, especially as we moved into an agile world where there's an idea that it's um, okay to make last minute changes, um, having an appreciation for the consequences of those changes and what it costs to create uh, QA plans um, and to do due diligence around changes. I sometimes see organizations where um, the ideas might be worthy, um, but when they come late in the cycle, um, is simply expecting the QA team to react uh, to what can be significant last changes, maybe not so significant from a UI perspective, but from a testing perspective, or given the complexity of systems that are um, integrating multiple sources, uh, I, I think that can cause problems. There, there was, um, there, there needs to be an appreciation and, and you know, again, coming back to QA being risk management, um, understanding what it, what it means to make uh, those last minute uh, changes and, and what it does to increasing the risk to a project is, is an important aspect and, and that um, often causes problems during, during the end game of projects. Sometimes it's, it's the right thing to do um, because that's uh, why you are uh, in an agile environment. You're getting feedback um, from your users and from their experience um, and it's, you're making significant improvements, but it doesn't mean that you can uh, hold to your original schedule if the uh, change is significant to what it means for uh, testing and evaluation of uh, the quality of the product. I have uh, also a few things. I, I want to add what the two, what the two of you said. I want to play second context. I think for the testing context is so important. Um, another biggest pain point I think is this budget. It's well, we said budget, but also ignorance. You know, actually, ah, oh, this is localization testing. What? Ignorance. And this is something that I saw in small company and even in some big company. And I think this, in general, you know, localization, we need to understand it's part of the local, the production chain of the product. It's a production chain. The same is the testing. And this is something that we need. It's a mindset that we need to have. All of us and also, you know, the whole company. We're part of the production chain. And this will solve, I think, in the end, the budget. We'll know what is the budget, what they will decide what to do. It will solve the ignorance things. And we'll solve something else, which is extremely problematic, is planning or misplanning. Because functional testing will take at least the same time that the regular functional testing will do for a certain language. So if you have one now to do the testing, and the testing will take, let's say, four weeks, and you have five languages, it will take time. So the planning is really important to decide what to do and what not to do. And, and, I, and I would like to make a comment about like the whole thing about Agile, at least in what I usually encounter working with, uh, what I've encountered with working with different organizations is uh, that Agile is often like mistaken with like fast and furious and, and things like incorporating those like last minute changes, that's actually against the, your, your good practices for Agile. So in Agile, you're supposed to like lock the scope and, you know, and, and live with it. And if you don't like it, then you can try to make adjustments, but you cannot be just like throwing last minute changes. And, and I keep hearing that and it does roll into localization oftentimes. So they break uh, their good Agile practices, bring something last minute and they may get it done, but you happen just in, in a step plus one, so right after that, which is what localization is probably going to do, then you are the one that doesn't that slows down the build or the release or whatever it is. 
So I, I wish that people were more agile, uh, but like properly agile. If if that's the plane that they're game, they're, that they're that's the game that they're playing. Mm -hmm. I really so, the idea of it, so, sorry, Tex, the idea of this coping, you know, if something cannot be done in this sprint, we discope it with out of thing. So the same with the localization. If we cannot do it right now, okay, it's out of the sprint. Yeah, so we, one of the things that um, is overlooked with uh, insurance is um, to do uh, in-country testing. Um, and so many companies will have linguistic review and use in-country reviewers, um, but it's usually specific to reviewing the language as opposed to overall testing of the product. Um, and it's important to have that, that last mile testing. Um, many companies, they'll do a beta test and it'll be mostly in their domestic market and not extend it to have an, an international uh, beta test or they'll do very little at the, at, at the end. So um, being able to do some kind of A-B testing um, in, in market, um, or you know what I call friends and family testing, where you have a uh, a community of um, maybe friends and family of employees, where they can be trusted to uh, use product and and report on results, some early feedback that um, will assure that you know that your product is working uh, culturally correctly and in context um, with. Um, in connection with you're delivering your product over wide area networks and you get the, the performance and, and maybe some cost um, cost of using packets and, and internet and some of those technical details that really show up um, in, in your product can and change maybe the behavior as the user sees it or reveal intermediate steps that um, because it's because the product is functionally functioning much more slowly, people are seeing intermediate stages of display um, that uh, look like corruption to users. So um, an, an important part of quality assurance, uh, especially for the localization field, is actually to um, get some sampling early in the market, early in the product uh, release stages, um, and, and get that kind of feedback, which um, for many companies, they don't think to do it or they don't think it's necessary. Um, but in point of fact, they can show up some real world problems that wouldn't be uncovered any other way. I mean, I'm okay, so I'm not entirely sure if you've talked about this before when I was cutting out, so just um, let me know if you did. But I would like to know how do you define the most important parts of the application you were testing? Because you know, you mentioned before the cost that is involved, and like, how do you figure out what's too much or where's enough? That's a difficult question. Yeah, I think that that's different for organization to organization. Going, going black at the answer, I would say, go with whatever has the biggest visibility and it's the most used. If you have to choose and then go down from there. Assuming that you don't have anything like offensive or broken or that you have to like test, it, I think that it makes more sense to like focus on core components and highly visible pieces and then trickle down from, from there. Again, yeah. doing as much as you can, but it's like with any other scope to like quality assurance, right? Test what is the most critical first, and then tier two. It it varies. I would, from. I would like go to ahead. add what you say. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, no, go for it. Go for it. Would like to add on this. I think uh, what you say is very important. And uh, what is a deal breaker? Yes, I think this is very important. And it should be the same, but usually it's below. It's the user experience, which is also exactly what also she says. So, you know, the user experience. So it can be actually something that can be behind the scene. Content is coming from different sources as Texas. But you know, what is the user experience? So I think you know, deal breaker and the user experience, which is actually quite related to what you're saying. Yeah, 
I think the answer also can vary according to the market. Um, I, I worked with a country manager. Um, this may be hard to describe. We had, we had a product that was producing data and, and reports. Um, from my perspective, being an engineer, um, I thought it was important that the data be accurate. Um, and for this country manager and what he, he felt was important in his country, it was actually the, the styling of the report and the quality of, of the way the report looked uh, was more important than the accuracy of the data. We, 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 it came down to some last minute, you know, we were going through bugs and what we should fix before we hit a, a hard deadline. Um, and I was thinking we should fix the data. And he says, no, if uh, somebody um, uses this report, it represents them and their image. Um, they can call out where the data is wrong, but it represents them. It has to look good. Um, and to me, it was would have been just the opposite is I think it's about the data. Um, and I can tolerate some issues in the styling of the report. So uh, some of these things, and I, I, I think maybe you have other experiences, and I, I'm sure that's the kind of issue that for some people in the, in the audience, they may be going, I think, one way or the other, um, because it's an emotional reaction, apparently. I didn't think so at the time. But um, so he, the answer as to what is most important may even vary according to the market. And if you um, think holistically and think, well, this is the answer according to my culture um, here at headquarters, um, you may be very surprised that you, you'll do well in some markets that agree and for markets that, you know, culturally have different expectations will be different. So you, you're asking a very hard question and often um, people at, at headquarters and, and, and managing these projects when they're doing prioritization really need to reach out um, in country um, and get, you know, some other uh, evaluations and, and expectations for what's most important because um, it's often the case that your expectations can't predict um, and can't predict how people will react and they may not be worldwide. And leverage whatever data you have. If your application is like tracking data on like usage and you know, again, you have like a big brother, you can tell what modules are like more important than in what regions and that might like drive your decisions. I think that more and more people are like making just the, even development like decisions just based on that. It's like we thought that this was gonna be like the killer module of our application, but no one gives a damn about this. And we're gonna be focusing on this one because it's like driving so much usage in this and this segment and this and this market. Yeah, that, that's very, that's very important. That's also guiding today how people are using machine translation um, because um, they can look at uh, their web pages and and the flow of users and identify the more heavily used pages and uh, the more heavily used content and make decisions about um, the need for quality and uh, they want to have information out there for uh, various reasons and pages that are less frequently accessed uh, that might be able to get away with, with um, and I won't say machine translation is always lower quality than human translation, but if it's more cost effective um, and they can get away with fewer reviews, um, they might use that kind of data exactly as you're suggesting, Jose, to make decisions about uh, quality and even the tooling and how content is created. Um, if, if the frequency goes up, they might revisit those pages and provide more uh, higher quality translations. I want just to simplify a little bit that I think the you know the, your question Danny, of what's you know what is important, what what we should test. You know what uh, Tex said just now, this is true for for the whole globalization, localization, you know, we are localizing and we're adapting the product for each market. You know, those markets that this is good enough and this is market that we need to actually need to localize this. And it's okay if we don't localize other stuff. So 
It's the same for the localization translation process. It's the same also for the QA uh, testing, you know, by each market. So I think that the, what Jose said, you know, what is visible and what is important and what is a deal breaker might be different in one market than another market. And yes, this is our work to, to decide what we should test. But again, I think that's the main thing is, I think so is the visibility and what is the deal breaker and the user experience that, as you said, text might be different from market to market. So I guess I, I would like to, because we're, we're starting to run low on time here and we have some questions from the audience. And uh, this one is, it's kind of like shifting gears a little bit. And I think it kind of goes back to what um, Jose was saying about um, testers being hard to find. And uh, I, I guess that what the, the audience member is saying is that um, basically she thinks that there's a lot of turnover among um, testers um, with short contract times, uh, maybe testers that aren't, uh, very familiar with the industry or the product. Um, some issues with um, testers working for outsourced, um, you know, like like companies like LSPs or or otherwise that maybe aren't being treated well, or they're not, or their work isn't steady. Or I'm, I'm kind of parsing through it here, but I, I guess the question is, how should people treat the testers, and like what's the human component here that you need to take care of? So um, I think I think that like the situation of like a lot of like testers is like very precarious. It's a lot of like uh, I I need you now and I'll throw you away very soon. I think that a lot there's like a huge ecosystem of like big companies also like taking advantage of like poor uh, contracting models and subcontracting models. So there's definitely I I would just saying that there's like a there is like a labor uh, concern. Uh, there's a we, we have a big problem there's a big community of people in that capacity in in the us in 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 europe and in asia so it's not it's not necessarily specific to to here so what maybe what could we do about it we can definitely in your organization you can care about them so how are they like being treated in in most organizations i think that where you go to work most people might be like treated okay as human beings but their contractual relationships are not great so i think that like those of us that are like hiring those people might be uh we need to like evangelize towards like how important this community can be and maybe like focus on the value of like having uh maybe a produce I, i'm of the opinion that a smaller pool of people more capable more happy more well trained will yield more uh, in the longer run than uh, the constant churn of people who are just like struggling and not necessarily getting to like know a product or a way of working, etc. So I think that it's it's important to invest in, in those people. I agree with you. And uh, going back to something we discussed earlier, if uh, we think about localization and testing QA part of the production chain, so it's you know the people will be there, will be part of it, and not just contractors that we need to hire. You know, uh, just to the testing event around the way. I think it's again, it's a change of the mindset that we need to do, you know, us in the, in the, in the companies. But I agree that it's a, it's a problem to get those people. I think it depends on the kind of testing you're asking people to do. I think um, I'm imagining, maybe it's not the case, the scenarios you're talking about where you bring in labor, they're running uh, to run scripts um, they're not as knowledgeable about your product. They're not doing investigative QA. They're not um, creating all kinds of test cases. They're being given scripts and told what to do. So it's easy to bring people in and then um, discharge them at the, the end of the project. If you're going to have a higher level of uh, investigation uh, where people are going to learn your product, generate tests and do some analysis of problems, then it's a different skill level. And for that, you need to really invest in people. The, the initial case that I described is probably one that is um, one where you haven't put automation in place because a lot of that today can be done 
through automation of uh, executing your product's functionality, capturing screenshots, and, and getting some other kind of review. So um, you, I, I wouldn't dismiss the, the claim that people are maybe not being treated as, as well as they should because they're, they're contractors. Um, it's the kind of the nature of being a contractor. Um, but I think you have to think about which problems you're trying to solve. If you want people invested in, in working for you, helping um, out your quality assurance tasks, then you do need to invest them and make them, even if they're contract labor, make them a part of the process, um, as opposed to just saying this is um, this is a labor job where you're just going to come in and do what we ask and and then leave yeah. when you're done. I think that letting them build relationships is, is critical. Because you you just like go in and you never build a relationship with the people who are actually benefiting from your work, and they're just like directing you. Then it's it's very miserable. Yeah, it's yeah. true for everywhere in the world. Yeah. Very true. Um, okay, so just a quick reminder for our listeners: if you have any last questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. Um, and actually, I guess it's a little controversial, the human side of things, but um, you also mentioned automation. What are the methods that you can use for automating your, your testing? It, there are several. So you can do keystroke and uh, capture and replay is, is uh, one method, and then of course, um, you can build into some kinds of products the ability to um, drive them through API and software, which lets you uh, run through the, the functionality and then um, capture the behavior in some way. So um, either screen captures or more elaborate uh, logging of the, the results. Um, so there are some tools that help with that often. Um, you need to design in some of the capabilities in your software that makes it easier to run. And, and it's an important step when you're running uh, multiple languages and multiple platforms. You want to be able to exercise um, your products quickly and in an automated fashion. I would like to add something that um, today that uh, more and more software has this accessibility API, which is important. So it's easier for automated uh, tool actually to get to the object and get the string itself what is there. So if we have an automating test for the regular version, uh, I think that we need to localize the test so we can test the localization. So, yeah. so, so I want, I want, I just want to disclaim that in my experience, like this is something that where you need to have like your uh, engineers to highly committed to help you build that. So this is something that yeah. can be done, but it's like the tooling to do it is not necessarily. In some cases, it's like expensive, and having people who actually know how to work on that, and then getting their time to actually support uh, what you want to get out of it, it's it's. It's tricky, so I think that it's not that it's not possible. It's that a lot of organizations don't get to really implement it because of all of these things, like lack of resources, lack of money, lack of time, uh, lack of expertise. I, I just want to like piggyback on that. If you're gonna get it done automated like that, I want to make uh, you, you know Daniel mentioned like that application Riggy before, so uh, something something like a Riggy is going to Riggy is just like this uh, in context localization. And you can uh, tool, and you can use it to like piggyback on that like automated testing, and then get a screenshots of the product along the way, in a way that then you can link it to your translation tool and see things in context. So out of like the investment that you can make in something like automated testing, you can get also like in context value uh, for exactly. translation. So that is that's one of the things that I have used in the past to like actually pitch for it. Say. Hey, we're going to invest in it all this time, but it's going to solve two things. We're going to test automatically, which is fantastic. We're going to create a uh, screenshots automatically, which is fantastic for the documentation people. And we're going to solve like the the the, the holy grail of translation, which is 
giving translators context. So. I completely agree with you. So you want to add to that, um, it improves time to market, right? Because if, if you're going to do these things manually, um, it can take maybe days or, or weeks to run through all the different uh, environments you need. Whereas, it, you know, once you automate it, um, it can be an overnight uh, set of results. And in the next day, you have uh, data to look at and test results and, and so forth. So, um, but it, it is complicated and it can require um, getting involved with your IT department to run all sorts of software, uh, virtual operating systems and, and so forth. So um, it can be worth doing uh, because when you're doing QA, it's, it's very repetitive, especially in agile environments. And uh, you've got multiple platforms and, and languages that you're, that you're working with. But it's not necessarily easy. I want to add to what you said, thanks. You know, usually we said, you know, with uh, the triangle, with uh, quality, time, and, you know, uh, cost. But basically, if we're doing the tests very fast, we can improve the quality. Because we get the feedback when the developer or the translator is still working on it and not just in a completely different team and done something. You know, it doesn't get the feedback in four months. You know, you get the feedback tomorrow. Yeah. Even the same day. So yeah. the speed here, if we're doing if the process will be very quick and very you know, the speed can actually increase the quality and even reduce the cost of fixing it. Because the the more you wait, the cost of fixing it just goes up. So again, to piggyback on that and give people like something to like go and, and test. I am a big fan of like this will not automate it, but um I like this, like this Jira, which you might know, this tool from Atlassian, it's a string of, uh, of products. There's like a, there's a component to it that used to be called Capture. Now I think there's called like Zephyr or something. Basically allows you to like be browsing maybe a web application and at any time press like a, a shortcut on your keyboard and then take the screenshot and edit as a, as a tester, like make comments on that screenshot on the fly and fill in a lot of like information within like a Jira ticket automatically. So you can get information like from the system being passed on to your ticketing system. The, the, if it's a translator, it could be like adding some comments in there, say this needs to be changed to that. And someone else on, on the other side of Jira can be seeing these things like popping up as part of like their testing sessions in real time. So if you have like someone like monitoring that, they might be able to see what you were just saying, like Danny, like see a problem being detected in real time and be able to act on that before even like other languages detect it or run into it. And just like even like either fix it or at least like send a communication saying this is expected, you don't need to report it again, skip it. Skip this whole section, skip this whole model. We save you a lot of time and allows you to move like faster and faster and keep a better track of how you got to what conclusion to what action. Imagine what about unit testing, the same thing, you know, immediately, to change the thing immediately. Uh, the, the other thing is, I mean, you, the comments you're making, or uh, both of you are making, are um, very true. Um, they're specific to, you know, the person who last made the change getting feedback. But um, there's also a, a more global project management perspective when you're automating. Um, your tests, you can also capture uh, results um, for all of your tests. And I'm a big believer in, in dashboards and transparency across the organization and having metrics um, and key performance indicators, which can be calculated as a part of the automation. So the next morning you come in and your project manager can see that how many tests were run, how many failed, which uh, modules maybe were experiencing a spike, um, and be able to uh, do some forecasting as to uh, how the project is going, when you might um, get down to zero uh, problems or where you're seeing performance issues and, and so forth. So, um, don't, I wouldn't look at this as just 
um, getting immediate feedback to the content creator or the developer. Um, it's certainly useful for that, but also from a project management perspective to see that um, the overall system, the overall product functionality, how it's going and giving feedback to teams overall as to um, when uh, the project might all come together uh, and also to see dependencies because some teams can't work until a team that is up the uh, supply chain or up the pipeline um, gets to a certain level of functionality and, and everybody can see the progress. And I think that's um, also useful for the team overall uh, morale and insight into how projects are going um, when they see the overall progress. Um, so plugging your test, test automation into uh, dashboards and, and public transparency across the organization is, is a, a key factor for keeping teams going correctly. And if you cannot fully automate, go with the Jira thing. It will still like, get you like information on like, what language is found what? Who were actually those testers that find a lot of things that end up like being validated as like real issues as opposed to the ones that were like false positives. That's a metric that you can have. How long do they spend in doing each of the sessions? So you give them like a test case, it's in the same system, they can just like go through it and you can compare the metrics. These languages are having more difficulties, these members are, gonna ha are having more difficulties and then make the same uh, the same decisions that, you, that the text is describing uh, from a semi-automated process, even if, if you cannot go fully automated. Yeah, WordBee has some capabilities to uh, demonstrate, to to display uh, various KPI the, that helps the project management uh, as well. Yeah. Thanks. Well, you're not paid by WordBee. Guys, no. Oh. no, not at all. <laughs> no. No. No, <laughs> it's just, it's just super nice. <laughs> we could talk about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just super um, nice. Like yeah, we try to keep these things pretty non-commercial, you know. But uh, <laughs> at least from for us, yeah. you know, like we we don't just want to. But but we we appreciate that when when text says it. <laughs> yeah, and he's totally right. That is very true what he's saying. <laughs> um, but yeah, guys, I think we're gonna interrupt interrupt you here. This has been awesome, but we should probably wrap this up. Uh, we don't want to keep you any longer. And we had a bunch more questions which we didn't get through, but that's perfectly <laughs> fine because it was awesome. <laughs> um, and also, thank you to all our listeners who are still here. Um, again, this is being recorded, and if you missed the part, you will receive it within 24 hours, so you can go back and watch this because this has been full of gold. And thanks to you guys for taking the time today to chat with us. Okay, okay. thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks everybody. And uh, I'm pretty sure the next time we do one of these, we'll have to do it about um, the metrics and, and KPIs and analytics, like j just for for testing and QA. That would be really cool. Yeah, just to focus on that. Okay. All right, yeah, thank sounds you. Good. good night, yeah. good morning, whatever. Sure. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys.